Welcome to today's episode of Medicine and Money Show. Today, we're going to focus on the essential financial information for, for, for today's physicians. We've got a very special guest. He's been working with doctors now for 20 plus years. I'm excited to introduce him to us. Uh, but I want to start with, I'm Chris Berg, the host of the show. Also joining us, Dr. Ryan Smolers. He is an ENT doc, has his MBA, and he's also the CEO of Store Fund, which you may touch on uh, later on in the show. Ryan, great to see you. Good to see you as well, Chris. Also, Martin Teradina, he is the king of capital raising for Store Fund. He's joining us today as well. Martin, great to see you, my friend. You as well, Chris. Thanks for having me. Uh, and then you can see also joining us, Alex Kinley. He is with Westmark Wealth Management, uh, his own firm. And again, been working with doctors for 20 plus years. So Alex, you you were like the perfect person to join the show. When you and I were chatting yesterday, I was like, oh my gosh, this couldn't be any better. So Martin, thank you for connecting us to Alex. And I think Alex, let's just start there a little bit about your background and why you chose doctors as a niche. Yeah, thanks for having me. I appreciate that. Um, you know, physicians, uh, I, it kind of just fell into my lap. Um, I was working with uh, two older um, advisors at our previous firm who were uh, had been doing it a number of years and just kind of s- stopped the marketing train and they needed two younger guys uh, to help them with their sort of physician market. And for a young guy who's 23, 24 years old, having a market was was gold. Um, you know, trying to trying to tell people what to do with their money when you're barely out of college is a very difficult task to do. So, having a track to run on was was enormously helpful uh, for myself as well as my business partner, who and I he and I started together 20 years um, at the same point. So, we got into it and. It just kept going and growing. And for us, it was working and and doing a lot of teaching hospitals, speaking in front of residents and fellows to try to get them off on the right track early on in their careers. Um, And 20 years down the road, we're still working with a lot of those same clients. So one of the things I really want to get dive into today with you is that so you've been working with doctors for 20 plus years. You start to see patterns in people over that time frame. Um, Doctors very focused on helping people. And so I'm just curious. As you get into the financial aspect of their lives, like what are the biggest challenges or biggest pain points you find doctors have? The first one uh, is is we call it paralysis by analysis. Um, so physicians are are notoriously they don't get out of their own way. Um, so you know we'll 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 chat with somebody who's maybe a couple years into practice and they want to push things down the road or they want to do a little bit more research research or they want to think about it. And then we reach out to them and lo and behold, they're five years in a practice. They've developed all the bad habits that we tell them not to do. Um, so really for the, the first pain point or the first issue that we see, I don't even think that they realize it's a pain point, but it's really that that call to action that, hey, let's just do something. Um, because ultimately with a physician, they're starting 10 years later than their buddy in undergrad. Mm-hmm. Um, depending on what their specialty is. So it, it really, that time value of money shrinks um, because they're starting to make money so much later in life. Um, so for us, it's getting the call to action right out of the gates. And then I'll, I can touch on a couple other pain points later on uh, today as well. Ryan, do you concur with that? Oh, absolutely. I mean, <clears throat> all my friends were out in the workforce for many, many years. And, you know, we were slaving away there there in the hospital 24-7. Uh, I totally get it. We, I think we did the math on, on what residents made and it c- comes out to like a buck 25 an hour when you add in how many hours they're putting in. So Alex, one of the things I want to touch on with that piece though is the paralysis by analysis. I mean, doctors, obviously very, very bright people. Um, there's plenty of financial information out there to, to glean from and see, hey, if I, you know, we all know the power of compounding. So is it because they've just been so focused on the, the, the anatomy and physiology of humans rather than their financial health, that that's where they're like, they're new and trying to pick it up or where are they at? Like, as their financial astuteness, if you will. From a, from a, a person who's observing them for 20 years, I think a lot of it has to do with they, they, they almost have to try to, to understand everything before they do anything. Um, and, and I think that's the biggest issue is we as business guys, well, hey, we can make decisions, we can move on, you know, power, compounding interest, all that good stuff. We get it. If you make mistakes along the way, so be it. But I think physicians get so focused on, I need to know everything first before I dip my toe into it uh, and get started. 
stuff. Ryan, is he saying that? One thing I want to ask you, I mean, is, is part of it because you, you've been trained, like what you do is life and death. Like if I lose, you know, a few points on a stock, big deal. I get up, do it again tomorrow, right? I mean, so is that part of why you think doctors are so ingrained? Like, yeah, I got to know everything because otherwise it could mean somebody's life or what is that about? Um, I think there's a couple of points there. I mean, you know, as you train for so many years to, to start over at zero at something is so daunting, right? And so to, to take that first step, like you say, dip your toe in the water, um, that's a gigantic step for a lot of people in, in the medical field, I think. Um, and so I think also compounding is such a foreign concept. It just doesn't make much sense to us because we are in the hospital and we're working and then we're working and the, like, you know, making money while you sleep, just never, when I was training, just never was a thing. <laughs> Probably because we never slept. <laughs> I was going to say. <laughs> so Alex, if, if you don't mind, let's jump into your, you got this presentation with us. I, and I don't know if this is accurate for me to do, but so That's as you've got doctors out there, what, what is that first step? Honestly, the first step that we do is gain trust and build credibility um, because that's when they're going to start to be able to dip their toe. So, you know, Ryan hit, hit the nail on the head. They don't even understand compounding interest. So so simple concepts that, that other people might take for granted. Physicians are so focused on inside of those four walls of that hospital. They don't even know what's going on outside of that. So for us, it's a lot of education. So going into the first slide here, the power of compounding interest. So if you go back to like seventh grade math, it's it's taking a penny and you oh, go back one. If you don't, there you go. Taking a penny and you double it every day for 30 days, you end up with 5.368 million bucks. Now, you don't have 30 doubling periods in your lifetime, but you do have four or five, depending on when you get started. Um, so that's really the power of this slide is understanding Starting right out of the gates is going to put you ahead of the game. Whether you get an 8% return or a 2% return, you might lose a couple bucks the first year. It doesn't really matter. It's just getting that snowball started so that it can roll down the hill. And then taking it a step further and being smart about that snowball and not letting Uncle Sam take a chunk of it. So where physicians are, most docs are going to be in the top two income tax brackets in our country. And understanding that and also understanding that percentage wise, they're paying less than somebody might be worth that, that might be worth have a net worth of 50 million bucks. Sim that's just the way that our tax code is built. Um, and we want to make sure that we understand that. So if you take that that same example of that compounding for 30 days and you tax it with our middle income tax bracket of 28 percent, instead of five point three, six, eight million, you have sixty seven thousand and change. That's because you're cutting off almost a third of those doubling periods, which are the most impactful, the largest later on down the road. Now, in real life, instead of having four or five doubling periods, you're going to have one less doubling period by having it in some type of a taxable account versus a tax deferred. So tax deferred is going to be your 401ks, your SEP IRAs, and then the list goes on and on, depending on what kind of a structure that you're employed by. Anything else here? Go ahead. Anything else you want to share about that or Martin, Ryan? I think we're good on that one. Yeah, we can move on. So really, and, and we'll bounce around a little bit, but what we try to do is have, have clients and, and, and our physician docs or physicians understand the differences between where they can save their money. Um, so this kind of gets to be remedial again for, for some people, others not necessarily. So you can go and invest in the S&P 500. You can go and invest in Apple stock. You can go and invest in whatever you want, but you can own one of those uh, one of those assets outright, which is going to be considered a brokerage account for the slide that's on the screen, or you can you can own those inside of some type of retirement account, tax advantaged accounts. So like I said a minute ago, 401k, 403b, 457, those are going to be for your employed physicians in a hospital setting. If you are a practice owner, if you are receiving any K-1 from surgery centers or anything like that, then you can go down the list and get some other uh, tax advantaged accounts. Roth IRAs are still available with the backdoor Roth uh, uh, able to, to fund those. 
Now that's been on the t- the chopping block for the last couple of years. We'll see if Congress gets anything done. Um, I would assume not between now and, and uh, November of next year, but after that point, we'll see if Congress does get that through. But for now, anybody can still fund a backdoor Roth IRA with a few exclusions uh, here or there, but we won't get into those details. So where it's important to understand is, do we wanna pay taxes on our investments today? Or do we wanna pay taxes on our investments tomorrow? And every physician that's listening to this would probably assume that they wanna pay taxes uh, later on down the road and they wanna save taxes today. That's not always the case. And if I had a crystal ball for every single one of my clients in a perfect world, we'd have a 50-50 split between paying taxes today or paying taxes later on down the road, which I'll get into the reason behind that here in a moment. Um, but kind of going through that, the, the slide here, if you look at brokerage account, brokerage account assets. So if you just own the S&P 500 outright, put money in, that's you, you're you using after tax or post tax dollars to fund that, SEP, that, the, that S&P 500 account. We're going to pay taxes today. On the growth, any turnover, as well as any dividends that are kicked out from that S&P, you're paying taxes on. When you start to sell, you're paying long-term capital gains. So you're not saving at any of those three spots in an investment's life. 401k or Roth, you're going to save two out of the three. 401k, you're going to save as money goes in. So if you're making 250 today and you put 20000 into your 401k, you're only taxed at earning 230,000 in today's uh, income tax brackets. Um, As the money grows, you will be not having to pay any taxes there. So as an investment guy, that's great for us because our uh, gloves are off. We can manage those investments without having any concern of tax implications. When you go to eventually sell or take money out of your 401k, you're gonna be taxed as income. So most people say, well, I'm not gonna be I'm not going to be working in retirement. So what do I care? Well, it's not that simple. It's not that easy. The IRS wants their cut. Um, And so what ends up happening is if you want to retire at the same standard of living that you had before retirement, you're going to have to pull out very similar amounts of money than if you earned at a job. Now you won't have a mortgage. So that goes away to a degree, but you also lose that tax break as well. So you're going to have to pay taxes on the money that you're pulling out of your 401ks if you're earning them at a job. Roth IRA is going to be treated the exact opposite. Money goes in post-tax, so it's just writing a check out of your checking account, so that's already taxed. Money will be growing tax-free. Money will come out completely tax-free. So in that world, all the gains that you've occurred in your Roth IRA will be tax-free later on down the road. So if you look at that, Money that you put into a Roth earlier in life, earlier in your career is going to be worth a whole lot more because all because the, the bulk of your account balance will be gains. And that's going to be helping you tremendously later on down the road. So um, on the podcast, when we hear terms that maybe not everyone's familiar with, we just want to go back and kind of clear that up. And one of the things you mentioned is a K-1. Can you explain what a K-1 is for people? Yeah. So there's three ways that you can get paid. It's W-2, that means you're an employee of a, of a group. Uh, there's gonna be a uh, 1099, which is gonna be independent contractor world. So anesthesiologists, ER docs, those are in the, in the normal sense, a lot of times will be 1099. Uh, any per diem, in a, any moonlighting typically will be considered 1099 independent contractor work. K-1 in the eyes of the IRS is gonna be considered um, profits from business ownership. So if you are a practice owner, you can pay yourself a W-2 and then receive profits from your um, um, from your practice as, as owning that. If you own any other type of investments out there, uh, surgery centers is a great example. Money that comes in from surgery center, that's K-1, that's going to be sharing of profits from owning that investment. Thank you. Yeah. So, Alex, let's go back to um, something you said earlier about educating doctors. Do you find in your um, firm that the doctors that are willing to go through the education process and have a a baseline knowledge of kind of what's going on, not only in the world, but what you guys are doing and placing their capital and allocating, do you find that they are they end up being better investors um, 
and or um, when things go a little sideways in the market that they are able to withstand that um, more easily? No question. Um, and not not to kind of circle back around, but I would say 99% of our clients go through the education with us um, because we, we really try to hold ourselves out as as a financial advisor. So it's, we're not just you know their investment manager, but we're really looking at everything in their financial household and we're making recommendations or we're pointing them in the right direction for, for the experts to chat with them, whether it be trust and wills or et cetera. So 99% of our clients go through the education, but to answer the question, no doubt they can withstand the ups and the downs of the market. They understand that, listen, we are in a, you know, your certain risk profile and the client understands that they understand their time horizon. They understand that the markets can go down, you know, a 15% correction overnight, you know, COVID hit markets are down 30%. Everyone's freaking out. People are saying our clients calling us. I had two or three clients call us, but other than that, most of them understand that their time horizon is not, you know, 10 days, but it's, you know, 20 years. So the, the answer to that is, yeah, they, they can withstand it a lot better than a lot of other people can. So do you think that that speaks to the point of the analysis by paralysis comment that you made? Maybe if they, if um, doctors did have that baseline knowledge that they may be better um, suited to go through that process a little bit better without a question. And that's really why our kind of fel resident and fellowship speaker series kind of came out uh, out of that, because we did realize that the docs that were older, they had made so many mistakes, not just kind of not knowing what you don't know. Uh, it, it was the idea behind it. So we tried to get into a ton of different teaching hospitals just to do, uh, you know, grand rounds or a, or a lunch and learn here or there uh, for their different groups being very, non-salesy. That's the reason why we got asked back um, and just providing some education and then letting them know that they've got a resource when they did get out, if they wanted to, to start going down this process. So let me ask you one more question. Um, with, can you speak to the point about sort of people like us that are um, providing, trying to provide value for doctors versus um just putting them their money in the S and P and and letting it ride, and what what value there is for your firm and others that are in the same sort of category. Yeah, so you know, putting in the S and P and letting it ride is not a bad idea. The hard part there is one, taxes. You're not you're you're going to get hammered in taxes if we don't go through the tax code and try to figure out other opportunities and other avenues. We still might be investing in the S and P. But now we're going to be looking at other areas to avoid taxes on the S&P, if you will. Yeah. The other piece of it is, I mean, we're going to have access to institutional money managers that, that a retail client would not have. So we're going to be overall, we're going to be outperforming the S&P by probably taking on a little bit less risk. But I think where we earn our keep is by coaching and managing expectations. So if if a doc's doing it on their own and they get inundated and they start to get really nervous about where the market's going and they start reading, you know, a hundred different financial articles, they're, they're going to have this, uh, this uneasiness and this anxiety that more than likely they're going to take money out at the bad time. So, they, you know, the Warren Buffett quote that's so famous is be greedy when others are fearful, be fearful when others are greedy. But practicality, it's really, really hard to do that if you don't do this on a day to day basis. Absolutely. And you're also up against guys like you that have those resources. And it um, seems like to me a lot of retail gets shaken out in, in those circumstances. That's right. Alex, I got one question. So you, you had mentioned retirement accounts and, you know, buying stocks or um, S&P 500. But how can your clients maybe use uh, or better leverage their retirement accounts to direct it towards, let's say, real estate, right, when they do want those tax benefits? So how do you advise them to work through that? What's that process look like? How do you help them evaluate that um, and do the due diligence? So 
Well, so t typically in a retirement account, you don't need an additional layer of, of tax uh, uh, breaks, if you will. Really, it's going to be needed more in the brokerage space. Um, but for us, unless it's going to be a registered security where we are, we can't give specific advice on on outside real estate, um, if, if that makes sense. If a client is really uh, wanting to go down that road, we're going to refer them out or we could uh, oftentimes, you know, refer out and, and maybe put them into a self-directed uh, IRA situation, which we've got some some other um, individuals who, who run those companies. So clients will basically take a chunk uh, of their IRA, put it into a self-directed IRA, and then they can go out and buy real estate inside of there. Um, but where, where I see, you know, if, if you're kind of alluding to the depreciation and, and things like that, that real estate is going to offer you, um, that's typically going to, to be more advantageous in a brokerage account environment and not inside of retirement accounts. Can you expand on that just a little bit? Yeah. So inside your retirement accounts, you know, let's say it, it kind of is what it is. So you can't take depreciation. You're not depreciating off of anything because it's in a 401k environment, IRA environment, Roth environment. So now where, where you can leverage is if it's in a self-directed and you're going out and buying, you know, individual homes or some multifamily proper, uh, 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 real estate and things like that, you can use leverage to your advantage in, in that sense. But using, the, the the concept of depreciation inside a 401k it's not going to it's not going to do anything because the one when you take the money out if you take the money out of a 401k environment it's all going to be taxed as income no matter what Roth IRA if you take the money out it's all tax free no matter what so you don't have to have that additional layer of tax advantage inside of a tax advantaged investment already very good uh, explanation thank you very much yeah of course next slide sure we can just go through uh so this is a brief one and and we spoke about this earlier but some docs don't understand that we have a marginal tax bracket system and i think it's really helpful to understand because it's also helpful to understand where we've been as a country so uh, the the most recent tax cuts happened in 2018 when trump was in office and he brought our highest marginal bracket down from 39.6 down to 37. So what that means to the audience, if you make, and on this uh, sheet, 518,000 uh, bucks, or sorry, $622,000 as a married household. So I've had clients come to me and say, Alex, I don't think I wanna take my bonus at the end of the year because it's gonna kick me above that 622 number. Well, that's not the way to think about it. All that means is that, the difference. So let's say that the bonus, let's make our math really easy. Our bonus was 10 grand. That just means that that additional 10,000 that you're receiving is taxed at 37%. That doesn't change all the other brackets that happened before that $622,000 number. So that's important to understand because on the next slide, we're going to talk a little bit of on a historical um, front on where taxes have been. So you've got a blue line, and you've got a red line. Red line is our highest marginal bracket we've had in our country's history. The blue line is our lowest marginal bracket we've had in our country's history. If you zoom in there, if you look between um, the uh, sort of mid fifties, uh, about 1950 to, to later in 1960, almost two decades worth, you've got um, a, a marginal bracket that's above 90, 90%. So before um, Ronald Reagan was in office, he would often say that he will never do more than two movies a year. Reason being, he made about a hundred thousand bucks a movie and the marginal bracket or the, the line in the sand to hit that 90% bracket was, was 180 to 200,000 bucks. So if Ronald Reagan made a third movie, he would basically be earning less than 10 cents on every dollar that he was gonna be earning on that movie or he would keep on that movie. So are we ever going to get back to 90? No, I, I just, I, I don't see that ever happening and again, but recent history, you can look at, at Carter administration. It was still at 70, 70%. Reaganomics kicked in, got it all the way down to 25% by the, by the time Reagan uh, left office. And, and it's very, it's, you, you can tell who, what, what type of administrations in office. So you've got Clinton, 
uh, was back up to 40. Bush two was down to 35. Uh, Obama 39.6. And now we're at 37 from Trump and Biden hasn't gotten anywhere uh, up to this point. So we're at 37 on the highest marginal bracket. Now, when Reaganomics and this probably going into a little bit too much history, but Reaganomics kicked in and the idea was if we can get more people working, that means that we can generate more tax revenue for the country. Great, it worked. Where are we now from a, an employment perspective? We pretty much full employment. We can't get anybody else employed. We're running a, an enormous deficit year over year over year. The only way to get out of this deficit at this stage of the game, Reaganomics is, is done because we can't get any more people to, uh, to work. So now it's a matter of increasing taxes, whether it's increasing uh, marginal income tax brackets, especially on the high, high income in, uh, earners, or it's increasing capital gains rates, which we've seen kind of on and off the, the, um, the docket from, from depending on who's, who's in Congress, but we've seen that over the last six to eight years. So it's going to be interesting to see where we're going here, but we've got to make up the difference of what we're bringing in versus what we're spending. So, yeah, we uh, talk about that a lot with the example with the doctor that was saying that he didn't want to make any more money over the over the tax bracket. We, we call that uh, letting the economic dog wag the tail. Um, <laughs> so um, it's kind of interesting that, that that mentality comes into play. Yeah, so um, and, and, and still kind of going along the lines on, on this screen, really, it's it's nobody knows what's going to happen. But going back to the shoot, do we pay taxes today or do we pay taxes tomorrow? To me, we've always have we always have had a marginal income tax bracket. I believe we'll always have a marginal income tax bracket. So if that's the case, ideally, we save some on the high end with our pre-tax accounts. And we save some on the back end later on down the road with our tax advantage Roths um, and then getting into real estate as well. Alex, you and I touched on this a little bit yesterday, but how much headspace does the do taxes take up as far as a pain point for doctors? In my opinion, a, a big portion of it. Um, and the reason being, it's a seismic shift in their thinking uh, when they go into practice. If, if they look at their paycheck when they were a resident or a fellow, versus when they start going into practice, they're paying more in taxes their first year in practice than what they made their last year of training. So it, it quickly changes their mindset, I think. Yeah. That's going to be a tough pill to swallow. <laughs> it sure was. <laughs> Uh, so, Alex, can you can you speak a little bit? I mean, you guys live in in this world uh, every day. I would imagine uh, the importance of the the ordinary income versus uh, long term capital gains and how that can play in your favor and and what that means for day traders versus I would imagine firms like yours. Yeah. So let's 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 dive a little bit deeper on that. So you've got. Um, there's different ways that you're taxed depending on how you're getting, how you're receiving money. So you have ordinary income, money that you are receiving at your job. That is going to be uh, on that on that previous slide on the highest 37%. You still have to add in your state income taxes depending on what state you're living in, um, as well as FICA, Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid. But let's just stick to federal taxes right now. 37% on the federal side. So if you are in that highest bracket, if you bought and sold a stock over longer than a one year period of time, the, the feds give you a little bit of a tax break and it's now instead of 37%, now you're only paying 20%. And it doesn't sound like a lot, but if you think about that compounding interest um, slide from a couple of moments ago, it really adds up long term um, because the more you have invested, the more that that snowball is going to be able to roll down that hill without Uncle Sam interfering as much as, as they are. Um, dividends fall into the same boat as long as they're qualified dividends. So qualified dividends are also at that 20 percent level. Now, there are there is a 15 percent level if you're at, an, at a lower income tax bracket, which going back to the, the idea that I think our country values and uh, and and gives quite a bit of breaks for business owners. For high high income employees, you don't have as many breaks. You don't have as many um, 
uh, benefits to do that. So when you're an employed physician, you're getting hammered on taxes, you're getting into the highest capital gains rates, you're getting the highest dividends rates, et cetera. Yeah, very interesting. Um, really something to think about, I, I believe. Um, let me ask you this, in, in your firm, uh, do you guys get questions a lot about how to protect your capital and um, sort of, we, we spoke a little bit about the taxes, but um, maybe some other ways um, of, of doing that. Is that something that you guys touch upon in your education? Yeah, that's a big part. So really two pain points I, that I have found physicians have are going to be taxes and asset protection. So how do you keep what you've built? Um, and old Uncle Sam ultimately is a big part of that, um, but we've already discussed that to a degree. The other piece of it are going to be lawsuits and creditors. So if, if, I, if I bring up asset protection, physicians always go to malpractice. Um, and I don't know if this is a national statistic, but over the last 20 years of doing this, working with physicians specifically, we've had about two, two and a half times as many docs go through personal lawsuits as they've gone through professional lawsuits. So mm -hmm. personal lawsuits is going to be anything outside of work, the dog getting out and biting somebody, um, having, a, having a hosting a holiday party and somebody leaves your house with the cool two, or in your case, the five cool initials after your last name, and they get in, in a car wreck, they don't have a pot to piss in, but they came from the house that might. So they were the ones that served the three glasses of wine. We've had a client go through that. Um, we've had a client go through having a trampoline in his backyard, a neighborhood kid came in through the side, uh, side gate, clients weren't even home, jumping on the trampoline, compound fracture, uh, parents of the neighborhood kid sued our client. Uh, the plaintiff's attorney called it an attractive nuisance and no 12 year old boy could help, help him talk. <laughs> um, so there, there's a so there's there are a number of asset protection attorneys out there that are more than happy to draw up an asset protection plan and charge you thirty grand and it'll probably be in the neighborhood of five to seven grand a year to keep that thing going. But I think more importantly, uh, if if it's a client of ours, we need to understand what your asset mix looks like. What assets do you have? What do you have on the books? And also what what state you're living in? What state do you work in? What state do you domicile in? Because states. Certain states have certain asset protection laws that are, that are already built in uh, to, to those state statutes. Um, we're in Arizona. So our state, we've got about 250,000 that's protected in your home. Um, so certain homestead states, Texas and Florida are two that are well known. So if you own a home in one of those states, they are 100% protected from any lawsuits, creditors, nobody can ever take your house. In Arizona, if you're sued, and let's say the, you know, the, the lawsuit is, you know, judgment of a, a million bucks and you've got a $2 million house that's in uh, Arcadia and you've got a mortgage on it that's a million bucks. You've got a million in, in equity. Only seven, uh, only 250000 is going to be protected in that sense. The other seven fifty is going to be uh, open to any judgments against you. So they can force sale of your home. They could force you to take a HELOC, things like that. Um, Federally, um, qual, uh, fe excuse me, uh, 401ks, 403bs are going to be protected. Um, so any ERISA plans are protected from lawsuits and creditors. Um, certain states are also going to protect your IRAs, Roth IRAs, traditional IRAs. Some states will protect annuities. Some states will protect cash inside of life insurance policies. The things that are not protected are going to be brokerage accounts, primarily cash accounts, outside investments that are outside of any type of retirement, life insurance or annuities. So that's when you start to go into, well, how much do I have there? Is it going to is it worth the cost of doing this really expensive, really um, high level uh, asset protection um, plan? Or maybe do I want to redirect my assets to those other accounts that might be fully protected in my state? It just kind of depends on what that mix looks like, but kind of going into it, not scared, but really eyes wide open and understanding what you have and what you don't have. So we talk a lot about structure, especially in these deals. And, you know, I, I sort of see a doctor's life kind of the same way as a business. You're the CEO of your financial sort of 
world. And really one of the um, core components to that is allocating capital. And when you go into capital allocation, in my mind, it's all about mindset. So if you also believe that, can you speak a little bit about that? What When you have a, a physician come into your office and you're having um, conversations, what do you like to see in their, their mindset of, of what, you know, what they're trying to do? So uh, let me, let me make sure I understand the question. Is it understanding their mindset or is it, is it trying to, to sort of help and guide them into what I, what the ideal picture should look like? Probably number two. Okay. So it's, don't put, it's really just kind of the old adage. Don't put all your eggs in one basket. Um, so I, I'm a huge proponent of spreading that out because different asset classes are going to have different liabilities. They're going to have different um, uh, risks with the market. They're going to have different taxable uh, situations. So I, I think in order to build a bulletproof plan so that that CEO can, um, you know, change roles and be a CEO of his household instead of a CEO of his practice, um, and have his household kind of work for him instead of him working for it. It's really taking um, a, a more of a shotgun approach um, because you, you you know you you always hear these stories that you know somebody put ten grand in Amazon and now they're worth you know ten million bucks and things like that. But you never hear the guys that put a million into crypto and now they're worth a goose egg. Um, so it's just like the Vegas idea. You always hear about the guy that's, that hits it big, but you don't never hear about the guys that always lose everything. So in my opinion, we're, we're never going to be able to, to look at things with a crystal ball. So you really want to make sure that you're spreading out your risk for all these different sort of asset allocation options that you have available to you, but also don't get into these convoluted things that are so complicated that nobody can ever figure them out. Cause that's usually when you're definitely going to lose money but you still want to make sure that you're spreading your money around. Yeah. So one of the, the key components or one of the things I guess I learned going through the business school process was um, the difference between the mindset of being an investor and a consumer um, is, are those hurdles that, that you guys run into um, with your meetings? Yeah, I think I think it's even a little bit more remedial than that, and it's more about cash flow. Um, cash flow is the first thing that that we try to touch on because cash flow means everything. Cash flow means, excuse me, it means what does retirement look like to you? What type of a lifestyle are we trying to recreate? Um, and also, is it is it are you able to do that is it you know is it doable you know is your goal to be done in 10 years or 20 years and we want to look at that without rose tinted glasses we want to look at that with a really um uh, sort of unprejudiced eye to make sure that that yeah this is doable or no it's not doable but we can we can st we still have enough time to adjust x y and z to make that happen so i don't i mean for us personally we don't go into it with an investor versus a consumer mindset for us, it's more about cash flow and understanding that cash flow with the client. Do you get the question, Hey, can I afford the boat? All the time. <laughs> Which, all the time. I mean, it, it also all it depends, but you know, it's cool. Uh, we, we will go through some sophisticated uh, planning software, retirement projections and things like that. And it's great because it really brings it down to, kind of a client focused, easy thing to understand. And uh, it's some software that's not work. It's not proprietary. We, we, we pay for it, but I did, I've been to probably a month's worth of classes to understand how, how it works. And I'll never forget in one of their, one of the original classes that I went for the software, um, the guys who, who, who basically developed it, developed it for Allen Iverson when he was buying his 13th Rolls Royce. <laughs> um, so that always sticks in my head in, in terms of that decision making process of, hey, can I do that or do I really want to do that? What's the impact going to look like on my plan moving forward if I do do that? Yeah. I mean, I think there's something to that, right? Um, it, even if you just took that capital and put it in a shoebox under the bed and so they didn't have access to it. I mean, there's there's value in that, I think. <laughs> yes. No question about it. No question. <laughs> 
So yeah, we get it all the time. And, and you know what? Clients do get a point in their life where it's like, hey, I am on track. I, I love what I'm doing. I don't necessarily need or want to to, to kind of slow down or, or, or finish any earlier, but I do want to go and pay my student loans off. I've got, you know, another 50 grand at 4%, even though it's a dumb move, especially in today's interest rate environment, if it makes you feel good and everything else is on track, I can, I can say with a, a pretty good degree of confidence, yeah, go for it. It's not going to affect your situation. Yeah. So what other, we, we talked about uh, risk management um, sort of issues. Are there any other big ones that come up for, for docs that you can yeah. think of? Disability is always a huge hot topic, um, especially younger in your career, because all you've got are these, especially if you're more of an invasive type of a of a physician. So, you know, disability is always a really hot topic. Um, and where we come in is just making sure that you're not going with a company, but you're going with with all the different options that are in front of you. Um, and that way you can make a, a wise consumer decision and not just getting sort of pushed into one direction because one company versus another company. But um, on the asset protection piece, I did want to bring up, I had mentioned the personal versus the, uh, the, the professional liability. And one thing that, that docs do miss on, and it's a simple one and it's really easy, but we always tell our clients and we don't have any skin in the game because we don't deal with it, but, uh, but going with your property and casualty people, your Geico's, your all states, make sure that you've got a pretty sizable liability umbrella policy. Um, I'm, I'm kind of skipping around, but I forgot to mention that because if you do get sued for anything outside of work, having a liability. I think we lost him. Alex, can you hear us? All right. Well, he may have timed out. Uh, Ryan, Martin, we'll give you guys the last word unless he comes back. Yeah. I mean, I think there's something to the fact of, um, you know, in this investment financial journey, just start, right? Find find someone who you resonate with and um, you start learning, start going through the motions and, um, you know, get comfortable and just do it because you're losing time on this compounding factor. Alex, we'll you back, but I also want to be respectful of your time. This was great. So we'd like to invite you back and maybe build a series out of this. Are you open to that? I'd love that. That'd be great. Thank you. So Alex, we'll, we'll give uh, Martin the last word and then Alex will let you wrap it up. So Martin, anything else you want to add or share? Yeah, I just, I know that doctors are all about mitigating risk, right? And, and understanding their, uh, you know, their risk tolerance. So thank you for covering that because I think that really hit home with a lot of them. And we, we understand that that with our doctors who are investors. So um, thanks for coming on, Alex. Good to see you. Thanks for having me. So Alex, last word. And of course, if people want to reach out to you, how do they do that? Um, Alex at Westmark Wealth is a, is a email and uh, our, I'm sure we'll put up some, some information as well. But um, really from last word, I would say to reiterate with, with, with what Ryan said was, uh, Get started. Um, don't worry about hitting home runs. Ones and twos will get you to retirement. Great Thanks. stuff. Um, again, you can see his phone number here, Westmark Wealth Management. Alex Kinley, we appreciate it, gentlemen. Great show. And uh, thank you, everybody, for joining us here on the Medicine and Money Show. We empower doctors to financial freedom so they don't have to work anymore.